children, right? It's kind of, you kind of, okay, it's time to act like an adult. You don't need to ask me if you can act like an adult. Go act like an adult. I believe that Robert's decision was grow up. Act like it. So, how many of you have seen a diagram something like this on checks and balances? Right? Executive, legislative, judicial, checks and balances. I know government. Give me the gold star. Give me an A on the test. That's not our government. That's not our government. This is our government. James Madison again said, Federalist 51, in the compound republic of America, powers divided among two distinct governments, they control each other. But that's not the whole picture of our government. Supreme Court recently, the separation of two spheres is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. Just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. That's the Supreme Court. Quoting Madison, they say, in the compound Republic of America, powers first divided, as we've said. The two governments control each other. That's our government. James Madison in Federalist 45 said the power delegated is few and defined. The power reserved is numerous and indefinite. Any of you ever seen a diagram like that anywhere in your civics classes? Right? Rights we don't know are no better than rights we don't have. And if we don't know our right, well, so here's um, Supreme Court again. Um, Constitution contemplates the state governments will uh, represent and remain accountable to its citizens. Madison expressed it that the local or municipal authorities, the states, form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. No more subject to the general government within its sphere then the general government is subject to the states within its sphere. That's the Supreme Court. So you'll get federal officials and others that will say, oh, supremacy, you lose, the federal government wins. No, supremacy only within its sphere. The states form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy, no more subject to the federal government within its sphere. So the question is, Where's the line, right? Where's the line between those spheres? Where's the, we have to know that. We have to know that line, that distinction. Supremacy, right? The highest authority power, holding the highest place in government power. And if we don't know our system of government, then. Hard to know it though. It seems like so many people are making it so difficult to understand it. It's really not though, right? It's pretty simple stuff, right? It's pretty simple stuff. The, the, the question is that as the boss, we have to hire leaders who understand both the basic principles and have the courage to act. Not ask, not litigate, to act. And, and that's just governance. We have all the tools, all the powers we need. We have all the powers we need if we simply understand them and, and exercise them. So here's what happens then, OK? So in the states, we have unique land, we have unique people, we have unique territory, we have unique climate, we have all kinds of unique things. The diversity is marvelous. And we come up with these great solutions as what we may do with agriculture, or education, or social welfare, or pension reform, all kinds of amazing things. We come up with these unique solutions suited to our people by the representatives that we choose. And we build these beautiful sandcastles on the beach only to have the federal tide come in and just wash them away. And so what do we do? We get our bucket out and we start building another beautiful sandcastle on the beach. And the federal tide comes in, washes it away. How often do you do that before you maybe stop and say, hey, uh, maybe we should look at some kind of a seawall. That's federalism. That's this notion of this distinct and independent portions of the supremacy, powers divided among two distinct governments to protect the liberty of the individual from tyranny on either front, the Supreme Court said. James Madison introducing the Bill of Rights in, in 1790. 
He said, the state legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of the national government and be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power better than any power on earth can do because they are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. Think about that. Not the Supreme Court. The state legislatures, those people that you choose out of your neighborhood to be you if you, would, if you were there. That's self-governance. That's the essence. That's principle one in our government. Self-government. And so we choose people to represent us to do what we would do if we were there. To act like the governor if you were the governor. To act like the member of Congress if you were the member of Congress. To act like the state representative if you were the state representative. But they have to know because they can't do what they don't know. Yes. How do we do that when all of the regula regulatory juggernaut is, is coming at us and they're giving us 30 plus percent of our budget as, as the carrot or as the big hammer? Yeah, so how do we how do, do we, that? How do we be a sovereign? How do we, how do we act like it when 30% of our revenue comes from a federal government that tells us itself it's unsustainable? Just say no. That's the key question. Well, just say no, but you almost need a methadone program to get off of the heroin, right? I mean, if you just say no, people will be hurt tremendously. But also what we know, and again, this is Erskine Bowles, Clinton White House Chief of Staff. He said, no, we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. That was Erskine Bowles that President Obama appointed to the Fiscal Responsibility Commission. Problems are real, solutions are painful, we have to act. So in Utah, we formed a federal funds commission on the website, uh, federal risk at le.utah.gov. You can go in and put all kinds of risks, interest rate, dollar crash, all kinds of things. See what the impact is on direct and indirect funds to Utah. Look at the ways to respond to that risk and, and how, much it would, how much pain it would take to respond to those risks. That's just up in the last two weeks. We're the only state in the nation beginning to assess what does it take to get there. Because we know it's a critical question. How do we take care of sick people, poor people, roads, and public safety when, not if, federal funds continue, not start, they're already, they're already diminishing. When federal funds continue to diminish, how do we take care of our people in our neighborhoods? It certainly broadens the base, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly what brought me to that question. I came into this as an economics guy, right? I didn't, I didn't come in as a lands guy. I came in as an economics guy. I was in you know, the mayor's office of the city of Osaka. They said, I, I got to Osaka. I'm working in the mayor's office of the city of Osaka. Second week on the job. They say, uh, glad to have you here. Most important bilateral relationship in the world. This is in the mid to late 80s. They said, but just so you know, we're looking to China because you all have broken the basic law of economics in the United States. Basic law of economics, you produce more than you consume. You invest the difference in additional production capacity. Your deficit spending, history tells us you're on the way out. We're looking to China. This is in the 1980s. Just, it just ticked me off, but that kind of set me on the course. I was like one or two classes away from an economics double uh, at, at BYU, and so I just kind of geeked on international political economy forward, and it's that economics. But yeah, I mean, how, how do we do that? These are, these are not easy questions. But it's a math question. American Institute of, of CPAs, this is just math. Utah Association of CPAs, this is math, not politics. So then we have to look at these things, it's correct. So to your question, how then? We know the what, so how, okay? How many of you have ever been in a tug of war before? Ever done a tug of war in your life? Pretty much everybody? Pretty much everybody, right? Okay, so let's suppose I get 14 of you up here, and I get you to raise your hand and swear that you're gonna pull on the rope. You promise, I solemnly swear, I'm going to pull on the rope no matter what, okay? Right? And we, and we tie the flag in the middle and we say, okay, let's divide into teams and 13 of you go to one side and only one goes to the other. <laughs> How do you think that's going to work out? Not too well. How come? It'll work out well for the 13. It'll work out well for the 13. Why do you say that? No competition. No competition. It's no competition, right? But the biggest guy in the room is the one is the one on the other side. He's the biggest guy in the room. You still say no competition? Still why? Still no competition. 13 against one, no competition, he says. Do you agree with him? Yeah, he's a human, right? Okay. Even, even still, does it depend on the size of the one? If you had Andre the Giant as the one and you had 13 on the other side, what do you think? 
The 13 still win? 13 still win, even with Andre the Giant, okay? So now, so now, now let's say, now you say, okay, on your mark, get set, go. Oh, I forgot an important part. The important part is this isn't like the tug of war where you pull one side to the other. This tug of war is kind of special. This is where you just keep that flag balanced right in the middle. <laughs> now, do you think they could do that? It depends on if they don't pull too hard, right? If the 13 pull too hard, but if they all agree that they're going to pull and keep that flag balanced, do you think they can do it? 